Woo! What's up, my pilots? Angry Pilots are here, and we're back playing Minecraft, learning about redstone. This is episode four, so we're gonna. This walk is gonna get longer and longer as we go along. Anyway, not so bad yet. In house demos this time around. Alright, so here's your first demonstration here. It's gonna be some handy in floor lighting. Uh, so here's your adventurer's story. Uh, this is your adventurer's house, your safety area, your log cabin in the woods, you know, the good old days. Fishing with grandpa, and anyway, but I digress. So this is your house that you live in. It's nighttime, you come back from a long day's running around killing skeletons, and it's dark in your house. None of your lights are on or anything. But you walk in, and you've got a switch right next to the door. So you throw that, yeah, and on go the lights. Awesome. And it turns on the lights in your entire house, and you go around your house, you do your various tasks, you chill out, you hang out, you know, you admire your art, look out your window at the creepers. And then it's time for bed, you need to turn it to day again so you can go out and have some more adventures. And lo and behold, over here next to your bed, another switch, boom boom, out go the lights. And then you sleep. And it's time, you know, it's morning. You don't need your lights on anymore because it's morning, so you just leave them off. In fact, you can just leave everything the way it is. And then go off an adventure. And then when you come back that night, you can do the exact same thing again. And you don't need to reset it, you don't need to do anything. Go ahead and flip the one by the door when you come in, turn your lights on, then you do your thing, and when it's time for bed, turn them right back off. So basically, uh, this whole thing is accomplished with an XOR gate, which means that it has the interesting quality that the output changes whenever either of the inputs changes, and it doesn't matter whether they're going from on to off or from off to on. So there's a couple tricks that I'm using to build this house, and each of these areas, uh, there's, a, there's easy access to the circuitry underneath, so this one has a, has a basement. The XOR gate is used in this example, light switches and the in-floor lighting. So here's what's going on underneath the house. It's going to be a little bit hard to follow, so I'm going to punch out some of this floor so that you can see where we are in the room. Okay. Now, you saw it all worked just fine with the floor in place, so removing that doesn't change anything. Okay, so here's the first thing you got to notice is over here by your door, the lever is actually one block away from the door. Because if you put the lever right next to the door, it will make the door open and close, which you don't really want. Uh, and there's, there's ways around that, but it's still a pain. So I'd put at least one square away right next to it over here. And then this power uh, from, this tor from this lever goes into this block that it's, that it's attached to. And that block, being strongly powered, drops the power directly down. So it lands. I can't get in there because it's too small. But it lands down here on the top of this grass block that I'm looking at now. So the signal goes down to there, and in order to get that signal out from inside, essentially what is inside the wall, uh, I have a, I've used a half slab on the top half of this block, which allows the, the power to flow down over the edge. So if we had instead used a full block, it breaks the signal. It blocks the, uh, the power from going down the side. So that half slab blends just blends in just perfectly with the floor. It looks exactly like the blocks around it if you have a good texture pack like mine. Link in the description. So, ooh, up to fine. Going crazy there. I'm trying to go down. All right. So that's where the one input goes in. And then the other one is just over here by the bed. And it's the same setup. The wall block gets powered, which drops it down here just below the floor. And then that power is, at, is able to flow down to the rest of the circuit because we used a half slab in order to get that signal to flow through that edge. So, so here's where the two of them go. Here's where they meet up. It's over here at the XOR gate. There's one input, the other comes from the other, the other switch by the bed, and then you just feed them around over to here. If your house were much larger, you'd have to have a couple of repeaters in the way, and all that would mean is that it would take a little bit longer for your light to change. You can see with the circuit as it is right now, changing the switch, it's about a half second delay before the light changes. Not really a big deal. You could do it with a lot. You could do it instantly. Uh, well, almost instantly. The only delay you're going to have to have is the delay for the gate. But I actually used a repeater later to keep signals from crossing. I'll explain to that when I get to it. 
Okay, so you get both of the inputs. They come in, and they go to this XOR gate. And then, uh, the output is actually knotted. That's why right now you would think, hey, this is XOR. One of them is on. This shouldn't the power be on? Well, it's actually flipped because there's a torch underneath here. All right, so we send the power through the XOR gate, which has the, the, the interesting property that whenever we change either input, it changes the output. So our output line runs over here by the entrance to the basement, and then just around this way, and then here. So here's where the magic happens. Uh, the output line is going to change whenever I flip either of these levers. Oops. See? It doesn't matter which one of the two I flip. I didn't know I could reach this far. It must be a creative mode thing. Yeah. Output line flips whenever you change either lever. And then the signal gets to here. There's a one tick delay from this repeater so that I can power this block. Powering the block changes the torch. So whenever this signal changes, the torch changes and the light changes. That's all there is to it. Now, the reason I use the repeater here is because if you use dust, it gets a little tangled up. You've, that's, another, that's a trick you can use uh, to keep lines from getting tangled with each other because repeaters will not send power out the sides or in any, actually in, in, in any other direction other than the one they're pointing. And they won't receive power from any direction other than the back, right here. So that just keeps the two of these from mixing up. And if they were mixed up, I think you'd find that the circuit never turned off. I guess you'd have power coming from over here, and then if you turned it off, it would still be looping around. <laughs> so you'd, you'd, you'd get problems. Alright, yeah, so tricks to note. We used an XOR gate. Putting a torch underneath a lantern will, will power it. And half slabs allow signals to drop down over edges. So I'm going to put my floor back, since I actually use this house as my spawn point now. Uh, <laughs> and then we're going to go to the next demo. So you wouldn't have to worry about your signals crossing over, like having to use that, that repeater trick. If your house were large enough, it would be a lot easier, because you could just stick the XOR gate in one part of the house and have all of the wires running through the rest with some repeaters. And you could extend this where that if you just attach that output line to the to every light in your house, just with, with repeaters and running the lines under the floor, you could make this as large as you wanted. What is that sound? Is that the sound of a chicken spawning or something? I, I keep hearing walking noises when I'm not moving. It's weird. Alright, the next demonstration. This is, oh, and yeah, just like the previous stuff, you got a chest here with an explanation. You got a sign that, that names it. All of these are going to have AP on them because it's stuff that I've made up myself. Not the gates, of course, but the actual design of how I built these. Yep, yeah, so here's the broken door that you can accomplish with a NAND gate. So let's suppose you have some sanctum, some inner sanctum that you want to keep secure, and you're, you're willing to settle for an iron door as your protection. Uh, in general, there's no real way to keep people out of anywhere in Minecraft, because if you've got a diamond pickaxe, you can break through anything except bedrock. So you can pretty there's pretty much no way to keep people out of your house, uh, I mean, hell, TNT would blow the hell out of this wooden building, and uh, in Axe, you'd, have, you'd be in in a second. And even Obsidian, they'll eventually get through. It's just a matter of time. So, uh, But barring uh, the ability to build houses out of bedrock, uh, using uh, strong building materials and iron doors is really the best way to keep the baddies out. And it, uh, it, just, it just sort of shows people that you're serious about keeping your, your house private. This is good for servers and things. This particular door actually would be nice to have because of the psychological factor. So when someone sees an iron door, they're going to look first off for a way to open it. And that's typically going to be a button or a lever, usually right next to it or near it. So anyone walking up to this house would think, oh, okay, I just throw this and the door will open. Well, okay, maybe not. I guess the door's not connected to that. That's weird. So I guess I'll just... Uh, They'll just break in. We'll do what's called a redstone break in, and uh, I'm just going to apply power to the door with the lever I happen to have, and it'll show. It'll open the door because when you flip the power of the blocks adjacent to a door, it activates the door. Except for this door, which apparently is broken. It's like what? And the the door is broken. That's why it's, that's why I, I call it the broken door design is because even the break in doesn't seem to work. It's like when you give power to this, it it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't open the door. It's like, why? It's broken. What's going on? It's actually pretty simple what's going on here. Uh, we're doing a, it's a NAND gate. And in order for this door to respond to any other signals, 
you gotta turn off the other torch. And it just so happens to be hidden over here in this bush. So I'll go ahead and do that. So you would hide this lever wherever you liked. Uh, I just put some leaves around it to sort of demonstrate that you would want to hide it somewhere. The whole idea is that they don't find this lever. Uh, and that they, don't, they don't even perceive that there would be another lever around. Uh, yeah, so once that's flipped, the door, the door would behave just like you think it would. You can even, uh, I think, use levers to... No, the levers still don't work, but this lever will open the door. And then, uh, you're inside wherever. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I, I like especially the psychological factor for this, because if they if they uh, have any respect for property, they're not going to just blow through the wall of your house. If you assume that they aren't going to do that, then having the lever not work and <laughs> cheating with another lever not work, they're probably just going to say, all right, whatever, and move on. So here's how it goes. The default state is that you have this lever flipped like that. And underneath here, we have what is even simpler than the last building, uh, just a simple NAND gate. This, isn't, this looks pretty similar to our standard design. Here's the two inputs, which is the two levers. Uh, the first is this lever over here. This uh, power is coming from the block directly above where the torch is sitting, or the lever is sitting, rather. So there's this one input here, comes around to the NAND gate. And the other input is in the side of the house. You can see the dirt and the, or the wood blocks up there that have grass. That's where the other lever is, next to the corner of the house. Another input. And here. Now if you remember, uh, the output to this gate, will uh, a NAND gate, will always be on, except for when both of the inputs are on. So basically, I, you, can power, or you can power this line, Oops, let's not fall out of the whole world here. I have died a couple times doing that while I was building these. Punch right through the bedrock. Yeah, so you can power this line, uh, flip that torch on the corner of the house all you want, and it doesn't matter, it's not going to change the output here, unless you flip the other lever as well. So as soon as... Just run over here. As soon as this lever is activated, once you've found it, and it turns off this torch, then the door behaves like you would expect. Here. You can actually hear it opening and closing. So that's how the, uh, the this other torch being off, this other power source being on, rather, bleh, my words, what are they? This other lever being off means that the NAND gate will always have an on output. And you're probably wondering, wait, 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 wait hang on now, if this door has got power going to it, then why, is it op why isn't it open? Why, why would it be closed in instead? Well, it's a little quirk that doors have, actually, that, that makes this work. Let me get an iron door here so I can demonstrate up to the side. So when I lay down an iron door, the default way for it to face is whatever way you're, you're facing. But the game really doesn't really care what, what way a door is facing in terms of power it's being, if it's superseding power. When you send power to a door, it's going to change its state. But the default... Ooh. sort of to face the way you left it. So, if you place the door like this, and then power comes to it, it'll change. If you, pace, if you place the door facing the other way, and power comes to it, it'll change. So, what I did for this house is, rather than placing the door... Uh, here. Rather than placing the door directly in the frame, which would mean power coming to it opens it, I place it uh, sort of wrong ways in the frame, like this. This way, whenever it receives power, it closes instead. Neat, huh? So the reason the door doesn't respond to other torches is because that power signal from the NAND gate is keeping it closed. So giving it more power isn't going to open it again, since powering it makes it closed. Cool, huh? I came up with that myself, actually. I don't, I don't know if anyone's done this prior to me. I'm sure someone's done it without really thinking about it, but there's your first proof of concept that it makes sense to do this sort of thing. I think it's pretty cool. I like the broken door idea. This is probably the most original thing I've, I've built so far in this <laughs> world. The broken door. I like it. I got my name tag on it. Alright, that's number two. And now number three. This one's a real popular one, real simple too. Combination lock. All it uses is knots and oars. Get some water there. There, actually, it's Diet Coke without caffeine. 
I cut caffeine in my, out of my diet. It's great. You should try it. So basically, you got these four levers on the outside of your house, and if you put in the right combination, it'll open this iron door. And all the assumptions from last time are still carrying over that they're not going to just chop your house down rather than opening the door, because there's, really, there's no way to prevent that. I suppose if you had on a server where you had building protection, I'm not sure exactly how all that works, but if there was a way to make it so that the blocks you placed couldn't be destroyed by other players, uh, then this would actually hold out to be pretty strong. So you got to find the right combination of, of which levers it is to get the door to be open. And in general, you'd want there to be a lot of levers, because the total number of combinations for these levers is going to be 2 to the power of however many levers there are. So the total number of combinations here is going to be 2 to the 4th power, which is 16. It's not a whole lot for a combination lock. I mean, when you look at a typical 3-tumbler lock uh, that you see on like a briefcase or even a padlock or something, where you have to have 3 uh, digits, that gives you a thousand combinations. Uh, here, with just ons and offs, you only get 16. But of course, if you had another lever, it would be 32 combinations. And with another lever, it would be 64 combinations. So here's 128 and 256. So once you've got eight levers, you've got enough that it's really uh, just going to be a waste of time to try and do it by brute force. So for the example here, I only have four. But if you were going to actually build one, you could do it with a whole lot more levers, and it would be much more secure. So here's how it works. It's pretty simple. You just have a big line running down the back of the wall, uh, a power signal. And wherever you have... Uh, you can actually set the combination to be whatever you'd like. Uh, wherever you want a torch to be off in the combination, just play, or a lever to be off in the combination, you just place a block there and uh, fill, fill the space near the ground. So this, the levers are right behind these four pieces of wood right here. And whenever I, you want a torch to be off in the combination, a lever, damn it, a lever to be off, you place a block here with the dust on top. And whenever you want a lever to be on in the combination, you place a torch on the back of the block where the lever is and let the signal fall down here. So the result here is that can I fly, please? Thank you. Where the torches are, you have levers, de levers down, powered, and where the empty spaces are with the, just the blocks and the dust, you have torches have to be off. So check out what happens here. So you have basically, you have just the signal going through, or you not the signal with a torch. And as soon as one of them goes wrong, so this block's being powered now, the whole line gets powered. And it goes over here to the door. Now, I have another not gate here, uh, just because I had the door placed sideways. You saw that in the previous example, how so it changes the default state. So this one, again, is uh, is strong, sort of a, sort of a broken door, because uh, this power constantly flowing to it means that placing other power sources... Oh, hello. Oh, no. Actually, I, I did this one the other way. Oh, no, well, it's, it's actually solved, that's why. Yeah, so... When, it's, when the combination is not right, and other power sources near the door will... Oh, what the hell? Oh, that one's actually a bug. Anyway. Yeah. Is it? Hang on. Nope, never mind. I didn't, I didn't build this one that way. So it's, it doesn't have the broken door security, but you could. You could have this uh, combo lock be knotted. Uh, or even just not... You know, let's just do that. I'll change it right now. I'll let the signal flow through rather than knotting it, which means the thing is going to be off in this case. I'd like it to be the other way. So what I'm going to do is put the combination in, and I'm going to place the door sideways. There we go. So now whenever it's wrong... Oops. i got to face the other direction. i got to face this way. There we go. So now whenever the combination is wrong, it gets locked and it won't open from torch break-ins. There we go. That's actually a pretty good fix to make. And here we go. Yeah, so the, the, the version that you download will have this fixed. So there you go. Combination lock. Very simple. Very simple. Very easy to build. And here, the coup de grace for this video is a 2x2 piston door. Uh, the only logic gate is an XOR, 
and I guess you could say that it uses knots because really anything that uses a torch has a knot gate built into it but we're not going to say that from now on because you, you have to use torches for basically everything so knot gates are all over the place so it's simple enough you look at the design from above uh, you have here's the where the door is and then behind here sticky pistons are pushing these blocks Whenever you change the lever, it opens right up. Thank you very much, sir. And then on the other side, you have another lever, which can open and close the door. Now, it's just like the uh, interior lights, and it doesn't matter what the other torch is doing, or what the other lever is doing, because both of the inputs have the power to change the output. All right, so the way this goes is you place your, your two... Basically, I start by placing the uh, the door blocks themselves and then the pistons, and I build everything else around that. These walls are sort of gratuitous here. You don't need to have... You don't need to have this much space. You could put the wall back here, fill the space in if you wanted, because all the circuitry under here is vertical. But in order to power this these two pistons, I send power to this block, uh, strong power from a torch. So that means that this block is powered, which incidentally activates the piston next to it. And this block being powered turns the redstone on on top, which activates the piston next to it. So if I remove this, just the top piston will come back in, but the bottom one will stay out. And if I break this block, you'll see underneath here is the torch that's going to be powering it, and we're, we're buggering with that torch from underneath. So now just the bottom one is on, because the block is there, and now they're both on. All right, cool. Let's take a look. 2 by 2 piston door with an XOR gate. So this one's a little bit funky. So I'm going to start by showing you where the two inputs are. Here's one underneath the front wall. Comes down here. Runs around over here. Goes into the XOR gate, just like the light switches. And here's the other input. Coming from the wall up here, if you can see it. Coming down from this block. And it runs around over here, into the XOR gate. So now whenever either of the two levers changes, the output to this XOR gate changes or from this XOR gate changes. So here's the output line to the XOR gate. It's right here. It runs over this away, and you see there's a block here to keep this line from mixing with this line. I decided to put a block there rather than using a, a, pist or a, a repeater to isolate the signal because I didn't want to put a delay in. Because it already has a couple tick delay because you have the torches changing here as well as the torches changing over here. So here's the output line. It, it runs over here, and when it's on, it powers these two blocks. These blocks have torches on the sides, right here. And the blocks above them have torches on top. And the blocks above them are next to the pistons. So here you have your redstone torches transmitting power vertically, as I had in one of the uh, early examples of torch behavior. So whenever you change the power to this block, that change ripples through this entire column of torches and blocks until it gets to the top. Yeah, where the pistons are. So here we only have two torches changing, so it's just a two tick delay. And then here we have two torches changing in the, uh, uh, yeah, one or two torches changing depending on what your changes are, your inputs are. So it's a fairly quick door, not too many torches in the way. Yeah, so as I was saying, I tried to do this without this column of torches here, because I didn't, I didn't want the, de the, the delay from the torches changing. But it got a little bit messy down here because trying to run these lines up spiral staircases to the tor up to the pistons took up too much space down here. It got caught up with either this line or this line, no matter what I did, because I wanted this room to be as narrow as possible. And there's actually a whole lot more space down here than there needs to be, and that, that actually goes for all of these basements because I wanted you guys to be able to see what was happening. But if you were building this and you wanted it to be permanent and not have to worry about it, you could just change all the walls to cobblestone so that you don't accidentally mine into here later. And then you could just fill up all the spaces where there's air with uh, blocks as long as it wasn't blocking a signal from flowing from the top of a, of a block down back down. So most of the ceiling in here could be one block high and all of this over here would be filled in. So you don't have to leave a whole bunch of empty space down here. But to be honest, there's no real reason you'd really want to fill it in just because it doesn't, it doesn't save you anything. And you're still going have to have just the, just the same amount of circuitry down there. And it's going to take up just the same amount of space, too. But maybe you can shrink it a little bit if you move the walls in a little closer. 
All right, so there's our last in-house demo for now. And the rest of the series is a mystery. Not yet sure what I'm going to do next. Um, probably some gates. We have a couple cool gates to, to learn about soon that are getting more complicated, but I think some more demos might be good first. So I suppose just for fun's sake, uh, in the next episode, we'll build a TNT cannon. Thanks for watching. See you guys then.